We spy movie fans have our share of pet peeves, which can sometimes detract from our enjoyment of the genre. Hi, this is Dan. And Tom. Of SpyMovieNavigator.com and our podcast show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies, your premier go-to resources for spy movie fans. Today, we have several members of our worldwide community of spy movie fans in our Facebook group with us to help frame these issues from a fan's perspective. So all you movie producers out there, take a listen. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Bill, Kenneth, Morgan, Lindsay, Eric, Seabury, and Pietro Rossi. We've got them from all over the world here. Big spy movie fans in our private Facebook group. Thanks, guys. Yep, thank you. All Very right. happy to have you guys here. All, all, right. Right. Thank you. all right, let's get going. We're going to look at a few main bullets that we think are major hurdles for us fans. And then we'll get your reactions. The first thing I think is something that we all feel pretty serious about. Timing. <laughs> ah, remember the good old days? When Dr. No from Russia with Love, Goldfinger, and Thunderball came out one year after the other? Oh, those were <laughs> glorious days. Oh, nice. <laughs> now we wait and wait and wait. Now, got to give some credit to Netflix and Prime and Hulu because they're trying to come up with stuff on their streaming services with original content in the hopes that something will catch on in the spy genre and become a successful challenger for Bond and Mission Impossible and all that. But, wow. Guys, what do you think of all this stuff? Are we tired of waiting or are we liking it? <laughs> well, if you don't mind me jumping in first, actually, I I don't like the waiting. Um I mean, maybe every two or three years is fine, but this big gap, especially during the Daniel Craig time, um, I kind of blame it partly on Tom Cruise because the Mission Impossible movies, I mean, the first one was in 1997, and he does his every three, four, five years, and it's still popular. Mm. So um, I think because of that, maybe the Bond producers, maybe they figure, oh, we can wait a little bit longer too. If it works for Mission Impossible, it'll work for James Bond. But the thing is, is that, you know, the actors, um, well, I mean, Tom Cruise, he still looks good for his age. So, you know, he could pass off as being Ethan Hunt and nobody complaining about him looking too old. But with Bond, it's a different story because when actors get older, a lot of the fans will start saying, well, he's he's too old to play that part. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, I would like to have an actor, whether he's in his 30s or even if he looks great in his fifties, like Henry Cavill, people are saying he's too old now, but he still looks good. He could still play Bond if if they were to hire him now for a five picture deal. If they got those five pictures done in <laughs> in six or seven years, right? He might but be eighty. It's take fifteen years, and that's the problem. That's yeah. true. Yeah, true. Because I mean, five. Because like in the eighties, right? I mean, seven nineteen seventies and the nineteen eighties, five movies was for the entire decade. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, from 81 to 89 between Roger Moore and Timothy Dalton, five movies for, for each decade, it could work. I mean, you know, even if you have maybe like, uh, uh, a movie like, um, you know, that could just for, for one moment could be a year later, you know, mm -hmm. to maybe just to kind of put it in there a little bit, but, um, yeah, the, the timing thing for me, kind of bothers me but at the same time now that the last movie they killed bond off it's like <laughs> uh, it's like you know part of me it's like you know i would like to see a new bond adventure but at the same time it's like okay well you've you've already crossed that line so i mean do i want to see another actor playing james bond again or okay. would i just be content with just watching sean connery george lazen and roger moore movies yeah so, there you yeah. go it's all right it's, yeah cool uh, yeah, I think it was easier back in the day when they when they started out, and you know they had all the books and they had a team of writers and they were in pre production when they for the next film when they were in post production for the current film. Yeah. So it was a lot easier in the sixties. Uh, but when they went to and when they went to the two year gap, that was fine too. Um, but you know it nowadays it's just so hard to line everybody up locations script you know producers got to get the director actor story and all that stuff and it just and there's so many other things going on it's just very difficult so i can understand 
but I would like to see, yeah, two years, three at the most. Yeah, that would be good. Um, but not every year. I, I don't think they can do it every year. Or, you know, they tried in 74 with Roger Moore. They quickly put out after living and die. And, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So they should take a little bit of time to get it right. Not rush it out there. Take their time. Um, but I could see it's a challenge these days with so much competition that it's just not feasible. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it, it is what it is. Um, as long as they get it right, that's mm -hmm. what's more important. So they need to take a little bit longer. Okay, but get it right. And yeah. don't kill them. Don't kill James yeah, yeah. so When was the, when was the last content? Time? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Barbara, you made a big mistake. Anyway, yeah, I think a lot of us agree to that. Right, uh, Pietro, you want to get in here? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to get in with what Morgan's saying about um, about he doesn't mind if it takes a little bit longer as long as they get it right. Um, because having waited three years, I would rather wait another two years and Barbara gets the actor that she wants, the writer that she wants, the director, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, rather than rush something through. Um, okay, but I mean, let's, Pietro, if she gets the actor, how long, yeah. if she's got a new Bond, then how long between well, those movies? Okay, uh, well, the thing I was just going to, I was going to get to that, but the thing I wanted to say is, from my point of view, is having a four-year gap between Pierce Brosnan and Daniel Craig, I think helped um, the audience because it was like a reboot and it helped the audience get used to the idea of a new Bond. Okay. Whereas having that contrast between Roger Moore and Timothy Dalton with only a two-year okay. gap, I think probably didn't work because it was too much of a jump. Whereas mm -hmm. if the Living Daylights had been done in say eighty eight, eighty nine, and then you went um, and then you went on from there, there would have been that gap. There would have been that hunger that there is today, and it may have helped um, uh, people um, jump on board with the Timothy Dalton as they did with Daniel Craig. Mm -hmm. um, you know, point. Has to, once you've got your new Bond and stuff, I mean, as a fan, obviously, I'd like to see a film a year, but we know that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, two years would be good. But ideally, I would say two and a half to three years, that window, because that seems to be kind of an average, I, I would imagine. And I think we'd be happy. do want to do other things and don't want to just be doing that one role. Yeah. Right. How about you, Bill? Yeah, well, the, the problem is, I don't think any of us are getting any younger. And I mean, not that they're making, not that they're making Bond for us older people, well, well, speaking for myself, but the fact is that you also need to attract a young audience. They have to keep the, the franchise going. That's and, with, and with so, many, so much competition out there, so many different, not just movies and television, but there's video games, there's everything on the internet. There's so many things competing for that space, they need to keep on and, and the, the constant eye. I mean, look, look, look what happened in, in um, the James Bond Jr. animated show. That was done simply to keep the, the public conscious of James Bond during, at that time, the longest gap, well, I think it's still the longest gap between films and the series. Who knows what's going to happen now? Yeah, you know? that's true. So, and, 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 but, the, but the other issue is too, with, with so much competition, they need to set particular, you know, uh, time frames or you know, set release dates so it doesn't compete with other big blockbusters at the same time. And the way movies are being made these days, you know, there's no smaller film. There's just these big, big gigantic blockbusters that must actually get into the movie theaters. And if as long as Barbara Broccoli is, is you know in charge, she's basically said that Bond is going to remain on the big screen. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So we'll it's, see how much uh, what the gap is this next time and what happens, because I don't know. We'll we'll uh, we, we're not getting a lot out of me in productions, but that's the way they've always been. They keep right. things close to the vest and they don't say anything until they're ready to say something. So right. we'll find out. Yeah. All right. We got some but, good but, feedback. there. Yeah, I got one. One other comment about the timing is I think it's harder to get the movies out quickly if you're going to do all the big stunts. Mm. And I think this, if you go back to actually telling a, a spy story, <laughs> right? And yes, there's some stunts in it as opposed to doing a stunt movie with some spy stuff. I think you can crank them out faster. Yeah. Um, 
All right, we're going to move on to our second point here. How about this for everybody to to digest? Overused tropes. Fans often get tired of seeing the same cliches like, oh, wow, the agent went rogue, that storyline, or this time it's personal, a vendetta that the spy or agent is on, or an act list, or, oh, geez, a nuclear device got stolen. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, some MacGuffin is always got to be there, right? So much has been done. It's difficult to come up with this new stuff, but hey, that's what writers are supposed to do. That's what the screen artists, production studios, the authors, hey, come up with new stuff. For example, we just watched the new movie, The Union on Netflix, and it was absolutely full of tropes. We just recorded this yesterday. And it, it, it makes it a little bit questionable about what creativity is here. So these overused tropes make the plot more predictable and therefore you know as us fans of movie spy movies we're a little less engaged in this and that's not a good thing all right guys what about this overused trope stuff well for me the tropes i think if the tropes are done how can i say if if they're done in a clever way i don't mind the tropes but if it's like the typical predictable style I can do without it. Um, like the union, I, I watched the union about a month ago and, um, and mostly because I was looking for a spy story, any spy story. Um, and, um, the only thing I liked about it was Halle Berry. That was it. So just like with die another day. The only thing I liked about that movie was Halle Berry playing Jinx. I see a theme here. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, it was, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't a bad movie, but it wasn't great either. It wasn't like, you know, they kind of set up the ending like there could be a sequel. Mm-hmm. I could care either way. You know, if it, if it's going to be like the predictable, boring tropes, yeah, okay, I could do without it. But um, yeah, right. if it's That's clever, a good example. not a bad idea. All right. That's a good example. Good. Mm-hmm. But, but also, with, with respect to tropes, especially with Bond, people expect certain things in a Bond film. And if it doesn't okay. have it, then... You feel maybe you haven't gotten gotten a full Bond film, you know, if, if you will. They they see that the same things happen every time. But one trope that they did not have that much of was having like the 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 head of the government or someone high up in the government become be a traitor. And then mm-hmm. the only time that actually appeared in terms of MI six was in um, yeah. Spectre. And thankfully, they didn't go with the original plan of having Bill Tanner be the traitor, which would have been a complete disaster. Yeah. And although I don't know if you read the Kim Sherwood books, so I'm not going to get into that. But the point is. So they, they, they so they they have they hear certain tropes but but not to all, you know. And in other franchises like the Mission Impossible franchise, I think that whole idea of the the, the lead being traitor was was something that's yeah. happened a few times. And um, another example I can think of was, was in the Avengers movie uh, with where father what was I don't want to spoil for you guys case what what winds up being the traitor. So mm-hmm. so the point is tropes are good if people expect them. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So some tropes are acceptable, and when, like uh, 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 Eric was saying, when they're predictable and it kind of ruins the storyline, then okay, we don't want those. But like in Bond, yeah, we want we want a car, we want gadgets, we want we want some of that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. All right, Morgan. The over the most overused, as far as Bond is concerned, is the Aston Martin. Um, yeah. It was great during Connery's era, and you know different versions of it. But then, you know, throwing it in for Brosnan, um, throwing it in for Craig. And I don't like the way they ended up using it, but I understand why they did that. It gets a little too much. You know, Roger Moore's era, he had the lowest, right? And that was his era, wasn't Mm -hmm. they? They didn't put him in the Aston Martin. They kept away from that. So each actor should really have their own car. No, mm-hmm. just don't keep okay. throwing that ass. They're throwing it at it all the time. It's everywhere on social media. Aston Martin, Aston Martin, and it it's a bit tiring. I mean, I love I love the car. I love it in Goldfinger and all that, but I just think it's overused and it uh, it becomes stale. Uh, and and uh, as far as stories are concerned, you know, let's face it, all the spy movies they've all been done over the years and they recycle through and it's just it just it, what's important is the actor that's playing these roles the story around some of these main themes um i watched part of the union 
uh, when it was on Netflix. And after about a half hour, I just got so tired of it. I turned it off. I didn't finish it. But not understand how fast everything was happening. There was no yes. character development. There was no story mm. built. It's just boom, 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 boom. Terrible boom. writing. Action. action. Mm. And I thought, I cannot stand this. I can't watch this. I had to check to make sure it wasn't Purvis and Wade writing it. Yeah, just, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and if you're going to tell a story, let's develop the characters. Let's just move mm -hmm. along a little bit slower. Let's mm -hmm. develop all this stuff and then hit us with some nice action sequences. And uh, But I'm just so tired of all the bang, boom, bang action sequences that are mindless. And a lot of them, quite frankly, are pretty poor. Um, and mm -hmm. stupid, I find anyway. Yeah. yeah, and that is one of the tropes they want to keep using, right? Because, and I think Mission Impossible influenced a lot of movies with their their action sequences and stuff. And and so now, oh well, hey, that's what spy movie fans expect: action stuff. And sometimes it's superfluous. So, yeah, uh, no, I will. I will say they, this though. I will say this though, Dan. They're breaking box office records with a lot of these things, right? Yeah, I mean, and, sometimes and it's, streaming it's records. Good money. So maybe it's they're giving the people what what they want. Just not us people. <laughs> That's right. I think the younger generation wants the explosions. They want the pretty girls, yeah. the chases, and all that stuff. They don't give a crap about character development, story, and all that stuff. Yeah. You know, I think back to one of the best spy movies I've seen, uh, uh, Non Bond, The Fourth Protocol, that came mm -hmm. out years ago. Yeah. Michael Fantastic. Andrews. That was beautifully paced, down to earth, gritty. Brosnan was great. Kane was great. Everything of that. That's mm -hmm. a that's a great spy movie, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, that's one example. And there are others, of course, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It had a great story, and it wasn't overusing tropes inappropriately. You know, like like Bill was saying, sometimes hey, you want them in there. All right, Pietro, what do you think? It's, I'm kind of in the middle here because I, I agree about the full protocol. But what audience was that aimed at? Because I can't see the people that would have gone to see the Living Daylights necessarily watch um, enjoying the full protocol mm. for example um but um i think that um the producers are trying to get into characterization with the daniel craig bond a bit more than in the old days um but the trope that i really 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 hate and this goes um towards superman and doctor who and sherlock holmes so it's not just james bond it goes everywhere it's the way everything is to do with the with uh, with the hero the hero doesn't just as in the olden days used to come in sort out the problem and leave in the last reel today everything's got to be related back to a hero and the worst thing in the is um blofeld being and i'm not quite sure of the family relationship but he's something brother and i'm not yeah, quite sure yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. To me that was just going and jumping the shark in many ways. Yeah, um, yeah. that Bond was horrible. Rogue. When was the last time that M actually called Bond into the office and gave him an assignment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the one trope that I'm really worried about is AI, because you saw that in wow. Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning, and I saw I forget what the other one was, and I'm worried that that's going to become the new knock list that everybody's going to do AI because a lot of people don't really know what it is. So they're just going to no. say that's what it is. So I'm worried about that. If you're looking for a spy movie, I don't know if you've looked to any of the movies from India, but India has been putting out some good spy movies. And if you can if you can deal with the subtitles, um, take a look at a Patan, take a look at a Razi, take a look at a uh, uh, art. It's uh, Romeo Akbar or something. It's raw. Oh. They're they're mm -hmm. um, CIA, if you will. And mm -hmm. take they're putting out some really good stuff, but you've got to be willing to put up with it being in a different language. So you're reading subtitles, but India's right. doing some really good stuff. Oh, okay. Also All South right. Korea, South Korea has been yep. uh, putting out some really good stuff as well. Yep. yep. Yeah. All right. There you go. All right. Let's get to our third point. Unrealistic technology. Hey, sometimes we don't care. We gadgets now are a staple of spy movies and overly fantastical and implausible technology sometimes can break our willing suspension of disbelief or our involvement with the movie. The Invisible Car and Die Another Day comes to mind. We have probably like 14 or 15 episodes on, on just on gadgets and spy movies. We always look at whether or not they're believable or based at least on real technology, or are they just totally unreal and unbelievable? We think fans prefer gadgets that are innovative and cutting edge, but somewhat believable. 
And there's a bunch of stuff that sometimes doesn't look believable, but when you look down into it and you dig into it, it's based on some real technology. So how do we look at these at this technology now that we get that gets thrown at us? Are we constantly have to have a willing suspension of disbelief? Are we willing to do that all the time? Or we want a little bit of this real reality based stuff? Depends how you look at it. Um, I was saying to someone um, earlier that I'm in England, you, you guys are in Chicago, and I believe others are elsewhere, and yet we're all having this techno um, using technology to have this video call. That's true. And yet, this is what Captain Kirk was doing in Star Trek in 1966. <laughs> And we, and I'm sure that the people in '66 would have said, "Oh yeah, this is fun, but this is obviously fiction." It'll never happen. <laughs> Yet here we are now. So um, yeah, how unbelievable is unbelievable? That's a good question. That's good. That was good. I think with the Bond films, is they've always had great technical advisors advise on some of the things. As Moonraker, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, they put a shuttle in space before NASA actually did that, but NASA did do that. And we got, uh, you know, the, the uh, Drax's space station. Well, we all had Skylab in space. We have space. So some of those things are based on real science. So, uh, but it's a fine line because you know, most audience people don't, you know, they're not going to necessarily know unless they do the research, right? But right. when you see it, watch a Bond film, you want an embellishment a little bit. Mm -hmm. These aren't the books. When you read the books, they're very down to earth, very realistic and gritty. But you want a little bit more if you're a, a movie goer. And, you know, of course, Goldfinger set the blueprint for that. And there was tons of embellishment in Goldfinger. So I think it's okay as long as you don't take it over the top too far. And, uh, you know, I... I you know, the invisible car in Diner of the Day was most people say, what? This is nonsense. This is cartoonish stuff. But it's actually based on active camouflage, which right. is an real yep. military technique where yep. they can do that. Yep. So um, it's it's a bit of a, uh, a fine line you're walking, right? But the, the bottom line is you want to try and amaze the audience. You know, they're going to mm. see something and they go, wow, this is great. This is amazing, right? But whether it's real or not, eh. Could be, it could be an iffy thing. All right. I don't think it necessarily needs to be real, just just believable. I mean, okay. Michael Wilson always said, like with the Bond films, they said like one minute into the future. Mm -hmm. It's got so, so and and there's so many different things around. So many there's the cell phones and all that that people are not as amazed anymore. Would be as amazed anymore as they used to be. So they right. need to the game a little bit with 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 every every time they do a movie. You know, I mean, yeah, like, and like you said, the S and is based on, on on real technology, and and something you guys brought up in the podcast I listened to uh, on on the gadgets of Goldeneye, and the whole yeah. thing, something which I didn't even occur to me with the pizza. I just believe the pizza on, you know, but then you're right, there, there couldn't be that much cable inside the belt <laughs> for that right. to happen. Yeah. But sorry it, to ruin it for you, that's all right? That's, <laughs> right? Yeah, how many times I see that movie? But if the audience, I mean, I guess they give Bond a little a lot of leeway; they don't think about that. Maybe other other franchises they they might think a little bit more about it, but the point is, you know, people like they like to get it, they like the cool stuff, yeah. and like discussing even the Aston Martin earlier. I mean, you know, I I think probably the best car chase with uh, with a DB5 uh, was in uh, um, No Time to Die. That opening sequence was phenomenal. That you could see the car do everything, and and it's a you know a sixty year old car now, but yeah. even so, but. So, so the, even old technology, I guess, works too. So, all right, okay. And you're right, though. It, it, it's hard to wow people now because they expect so much and we see so much. So that's a good point. Yes. Yeah, so the the one thing I'd say about this technology and the un, unrealistic, if you will. So when Maybaum was writing this stuff, he actually had a folder where he would just, if he saw anything in a science magazine or whatever that looked like, oh, this may be one of those, you know, we want to be a year ahead or whatever or a minute ahead. He put that in that, this folder, and you can actually see it. If you go to University of Iowa in the States mm -hmm. here, uh, they've got his collection in one of their libraries. And he's got a folder, and that's all this stuff. And it's like, wow, that ended up in that movie. That ended up in that movie. And it's, pre it's cool. pretty cool to see. And it was trying to stay that one step ahead. And Morgan, I'd agree with you on the invisible car. I, I think it was the way they portrayed it. 
Yes. But that's te definitely technology that the military has been using and, and working on. And the Japanese had a cape that they showed years ago where a guy standing there like that. And you could see through the cape because it's got the cameras on the back projecting the front. Mm -hmm. It was So it's been there and it's been around for a while. So I think they have done in general in spy movies pretty good uh a pretty good deal a pretty good um uh, execution of taking fundamental real technology embellishing a little bit and and moving it into the movies but uh, i like the conversation it's good eric did you have a, you have a comment yeah uh, no just uh, i pretty much agree with everybody that um you know as long as the technology seems plausible even if it's not realistic at the moment sure. like you had mentioned about the about the cloak i had read about maybe about two or three years ago that the U S army was developing a cloak where you put it around you and it renders you, it makes you look invisible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I was just watching, I don't know if you remember 2000, 2001, 2002, there was a TV show on CBS called the agency. And there was an episode where they were trying to track down a terrorist and he was able to escape the motel room that he was in because he had a dummy that gave off body heat and he was able to escape the room by putting a cloak around himself that protected or or it obscured his body heat. He was able to leave. You know, the TV show is grounded in, in realism. So, you know, maybe that type of technology existed where you can actually cover yourself or an item or the body heat. You know, I mean, yeah, the car turning invisible or looking invisible and die another day was uh, was little little too much but i mean who knows within five or ten years right that could actually be something real yeah yeah absolutely yeah. i yeah. like the idea of that invisibility cloak eric sounds like something out of harry potter yes yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's what they were talking the the, the headline in the article was something about harry potter harry potter's cloak yeah. um becomes yeah. reality because mm -hmm. he uses that in in one of the books yeah. he right. uses the book and um, yeah. to get go through hogwarts exactly yeah. yep Yep. All right. Hey, let's that's good. Let's go on to another point where we're going to talk about villains. I mean, if you don't have a great villain in a spy movie, I mean, what do you have? Mm -hmm. A compelling villain is crucial for a good spy movie, I think. We think. We often see fantastical villains, even in the older James Bond movies, Hugo Drax, Stromberg, Zorin. You know, they all wanted to create something magical, underwater civilizations, a new civilization in space to bring back down to Earth, whatever. When they're megalomaniacs with uh, wild ambitions, well, they were nonetheless interesting, even though they planned to take over the world or whatever. We find more believable villains like Goldfinger and Fran Sanchez and others that are more realistic, basically, in terms of what you might see in the real world or what spies might encounter in the real world. And they have deep and multi-dimensional characters as well in that. So who likes one-dimensional antagonists who lack depth in a convincing... Uh, well, motor? that was I mean... one heck of a way to phrase that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, excuse me, objection leading. <laughs> All right, make the motive of convincing us and make the villain have depth. Come on, how often? I mean, I don't know. Uh, what are we seeing? Are we seeing enough of this? Are we seeing good villains in spy movies in general? Not just Bond, but any ones you're watching? In, one of the, in the Bond films, at least. I mean, they, they all seem to have a decent villain. Probably the one film that maybe they weren't as good was, was maybe Living Daylights. Although it's a great film. It's a great Bond film. And compare that to like with License to Kill, which followed up, which wasn't as traditional a Bond movie, but they, they, they kind of made up with it with a really good villain. Yeah, he's so, great. You know, and but you need to have a a, a an antagonist, you know, to have you know, it's got good versus evil. You need to have the evil presence that the good guy has to take on. I mean, not say with 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 spy, with spy films, but like you like the Marvel films. Some of them do suffer because the villain is 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 weak, and they had to use Loki how many times as as, as a villain, and it's, it's odd because there's so many good comic book villains that exist, you know, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but the point is, it's, it's, it is very important to have a good villain, and, and it, it certainly makes, makes the hero look better. Yeah. Right. As far as the Bond films are concerned, the way I look at it is Bond has many different adventures. And he's, during all those different adventures he's had, he's going to encounter some 
good villains, some, you know, really megalomaniacs by Lonely Moonraker, and down to earth for your eyes only, realistic type thing. So he's going to, there's going to be a variety, it's a good, a good mix. But yeah, it's tough though. Can you imagine how hard it is to write a good villain yeah. that people are going to, and especially in the Bond films, 25 films, right? Oh my God. Like, yeah, uh, who's next? Yeah. So, um, I guess it is what it is. I, I don't know if that's a good argument or not, but uh, yeah, you want an interesting villain. Uh, you want to make them somewhat believable, not cartoonish. I thought Drax was very cartoonish because he didn't understand where he was coming from. Why is he doing that? Why does he want to destroy mankind? Right? Yeah. Um, they should have borrowed some from the book. I felt he should have had some sort of anger and rage in him, some psychological that make that's motivating him. If they develop the character well enough, and that makes the villain more interesting. And so that maybe is the crux of, of it. So uh, you know, making him more believable. And yes, okay, he can embellish and he can be over the top. But as long as he has a good, solid background, then I think it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Moonraker, the novel, is a great read, by the way. Yeah, you're right. There's some of the anger in there that wasn't there in the in the movie. Um, all right, how about the other guys? Well, I I agree that I think that the uh, the villains should should be more realistic. I mean, um, um, as we've been saying, you know, he has many different adventures. You're going to have one that's going to be very big, megalomaniac. More another one, more down to earth. But also, I like the characters, the villains who have somewhat of a backstory, like Doctor No. Doctor No, mm -hmm. you know, there was nothing special or big about him. But him being very quiet and when he was explaining to Bond about his background, you know, he was um, half German, half Chinese. So he probably wasn't accepted as being full Chinese. Mm -hmm. And um, something happened along the way to where, you know, he had tried to offer his services to the East and to the West. They both said, no, nah, no, thank you. So there was a background about why he ended up joining Spectre in the movie. Mm -hmm. And why he had some sort of animosity towards the East and the West, or even uh, was it Jonathan Price in uh, was it uh, Tomorrow Never Dies? He briefly explains to his wife about him growing up, um, you know, um, working for a newspaper in Hong Kong. So he learned certain things, and it seems like um, maybe the background, maybe he had been abandoned, you know, living in Hong Kong. Something happened to him to make him the way he was. So if there's some sort of backstory, believable backstory, as far as why they became um, a villain or evil, I prefer that, you know, a story, not just, just having some bad, random bad guy just for the hell of it wanting to take over the world. So yeah, I, yeah. I do like the realism in the backstories with the villains. Yeah. I mean, there were some good ones like Gold, Goldfinger and Fran Sanchez. They just wanted to run, you know, Goldfinger wanted to control the gold. Fran Sanchez, he just wanted to control his his drug empire. You know, mm -hmm. you don't want to run the world. You want to create a new world. It was just like, boom, that's what we want to do. But those guys have to be stopped, too. So I like that, too. I would agree with um, what people have been saying so far about, you know, it's better if a villain, we understand the motivation. Like Goldfinger, we know that, um, you know, his motivation was that he wanted his gold to shine, for example. But what was Staffing's motivation in No Time to Die? As a kid, when I went to see For Your Eyes Only, I didn't understand Julian Gl Glover's motivation and stuff. But watching the film ag um, again, I was able to understand what he wanted to do and why. You, you've got that. But the other thing is I think they've also got to be slightly larger than life. Even though I take on board what people have said about um, um, Drax, he is one of my favourite villains because he's memorable. Yeah. He is memorable. He just flies off the screen. You know, you, you remember him. Mm -hmm. um, whereas yeah. Robert Carlyle, um, he's a better actor. He's got motivation, but he kind of... And for me, he just glides under the radar because he's not as memorable. Although I think Electra was the real villain there. And again, she <laughs> had motivation. She did have the motivation. Right. That's good. Yeah. All right. Hey, let's look at another point. Inconsistent tone. Let's look at the tones of these movies because we've all seen every one of these producers struggle with this within the movie itself. You want a consistent tone in a sense to make it more enjoyable, maybe. Well, maybe we don't care. Our, you know, when our main characters move from serious espionage to 
comedic actions bordering on slapstick stuff, and then it could be incongruous and maybe even shocking to the viewer and, and a big jolt. So does that disrupt the story? Does it disrupt the narrative? It, sometimes it does, I think. We have a lot of that with Roger Moore. Roger Moore got constantly criticized for being too comedic uh, for James Bond. And when you have this struggle between the actions that are going to, and the, the the dark and the light content of the story itself, whether you're going to go from seriousness and to comedic stuff within minutes, we sometimes have an issue. I think Sean Connery, for instance, was excellent at, at balancing this with these clever quips and the funny stuff he did with the serious espionage in his execution of his missions. So is consistency key to maintaining the a film's atmosphere? Do we want it to be the same throughout the movie? Like you look at Dalton, you look at uh, some of these other guys that were pretty serious Bond uh, characters. Craig, there's not much humor there. Can we switch back and forth within the same movie? What do we want? I think it depends on the actor that's doing the job, whether they can deliver the right comedic or dramatic touch at the right time. Man with the Golden Gun is a classic example. Roger Moore trying to be tough, slapping Maude Adams down on the bed and twisting her arm. It just didn't feel right. It didn't look right. Um, and so they lightened him up, and he approached it from just the opposite of what Connery did. Connery was serious, and then he added the, a few quips afterwards, and it worked for him because he could deliver that. Uh, with Roger Moore, it had to be the opposite. He had to, you know, raise an eyebrow or make a quip before some of the serious stuff. And Craig, he, he, Craig couldn't tell a joke and make you laugh. There's just no way. That's not the type of actor he is. So you got to find the strength in the actor and then go with that. Uh, when you're writing, when you're writing, especially when you're writing and you're writing for an actor, you want to find something that works for them okay. to help control the mode. And there's no way it's going to be consistent across the board. It all depends on the story that you're telling and the actor who's telling it for you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, I happen to agree partly. Actually, uh, in my opinion, Roger Moore with the man with the golden gun, I thought Roger Moore's performance as James Bond was probably his best in that movie. Okay. For me, I thought when he was serious because you know he was trying to find out who was trying to have him killed so when you know when he when he slapped Maude Adams and 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 bent her bent her arm trying to get information from her to me it worked because it showed that yes Bond Roger Moore's Bond can be dark and you know when he needs to be um the criticisms about Roger Moore's James Bond was in my opinion less about Roger Moore and more about the writing and and the producers trying to put too much comedy in there, like uh, like Moonraker with the pigeon looking back and forth when Roger Moore was going through uh, Venice and the gondola on land. You know that's not Roger Moore's fault. You know when no. when it came time for Roger Moore to be dark, especially when he killed the henchmen and the villains, he was pretty dark, and he had his little quip and raising the eyebrow. So you know, for me, I think having some humor in there is not so bad um but when it gets to be too much it it's a little bit laughable and it even started before roger moore like if you look at diamonds are forever the comedy or the humor there was mm -hmm. was starting to go overboard in the 1970s even with sean connery so in my opinion as long as there's a little bit of humor like they had in the 60s and just don't go overboard i think audiences would be a lot happier with it in my opinion okay yeah, and and also I, I agree with you. That proves Roger Moore's versatility as as an actor. He could do both the serious and 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 the comedic stuff, and within the same film. If I remember the first Bond film I saw on the big screen was Moonraker, mm -hmm. and the scene where Kareem is killed by by the Dobermans that was so jarring watching. And I had never really seen a Bond. I think I saw Goldfinger on television like right before that, but I didn't really know the character, know what Bond was about. I was expecting you know, Bond to show up all of a sudden and save her, but of course he didn't. I mean, I, I understand you know structurally why that wasn't done. I mean, total shifts are fine within a film you know, as long as the actor, like you said, the actor playing Bond can, can carry it off. I, I don't think Craig could have carried off comedy in, 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 in his films. I mean, it yeah. took him until basically until no time to die, but probably I think the best sequence in his entire 
run was this was with the scenes of Paloma in, in Cuba. And she mm-hmm. was such a breath of fresh air. The way he played off of her in yes. that film was, you know, it felt like an old Bond film again. Well, I do remember seeing some Heineken adverts with Daniel Craig, where right. he seemed to be playing the traditional Bond better than his film Bonds. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, um, to me, I like the contrast between drama and comedy. Um, especially if, like nowadays, uh, movies are three hours long, you need that contrast um, between the two. Yeah, um, one of the reasons I'm not keen on Christopher Nolan movies, for example, sorry if I'm going to be controversial with really, it, but I just find um, that they just, it's just one line all the way um, across, and there's no shades, and I do like the shades. I mean, like Die Another Day. To me, it wasn't the, the, the fact that you had a different tone. Like at the beginning, it was very Fleming S with the torch screens, with the scorpions, etc. And then you move into very Roger Moore esque ice palaces and, um, there, dare I say, the, the um, um, windsurfing bit. <laughs> uh, dare I say. But, um, but to me, the problem was that the story didn't. It um, wasn't strong enough to carry the movie. I mean, I know what you guys are saying about the actor, but I think you need the story as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I certainly agree with Bill um, about Kareen and Moonraker and the dogs. The bit where the dogs um, jump over her and you get that close up of the jump of the dogs jumping on top of you, as it were. Mm-hmm. I actually think that is the darkest scene in any Bond film for me, yeah. mainly because it was a contrast to the cartoon that was all around it. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's good. good point. Yeah, I want to take this a little bit of outside of Bond for a second and talk about where I think it's worked and where we're, in, we're changing the tone between light and dark works and where it doesn't. So if you take a, like a look at the movie, the Melissa McCarthy movie, movie The Spy, or, or Spy, I think it is, that one was a comedic movie, but there were some some dark stuff to it. And I thought they did that very well in that movie, as opposed to something like Argyle or, you know, Dan, we just did Undercover Grandpa. And I yeah. thought the inconsistencies as they were trying to balance between the comedy and the darkness didn't work there. But again, you give me something like, you know, this like the spy or even the spy next door. I think yeah. they they meld that pretty well together. And that, those are not Bond movies when we talk about that. All right, let's move on to predictable plot twists. This is a little bit like our tropes treatment because tropes are used in the plots. And really, what makes a spy movie interesting or any movie interesting? It's surprise. It's suspense. Now, obviously, Alfred Hitchcock was a master at this. Predictable plot twists can make the story feel boring, uneventful, and downright kill our desire to watch more. So, and it happened, like you said, with the union. Uh, when you, get, when you, mm-hmm. you watch half an hour of it, boom, it was gone. So, guys, what's happening with today's spy movies in this particular element of plot twists? Anything good happening? Or are we stuck in a limbo of bad? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> We've stumped them. <laughs> <laughs> These plot twists, you know, as far as yeah, the person's renegade or he's a traitor, um, the last Bond movie, the the No Time to Die. I don't remember the character's name, but the one that um, betrayed Felix and James um, ended up shooting Felix yeah. and killing him. Yeah. I didn't expect that to happen. I wasn't expecting him to be to be a traitor. So that kind of threw me off. So I think, okay. again, it goes back. If, if, if you're writing the story cleverly and not just doing the same old boring thing the predictable thing i think you can still get away with it um and as long as it's not happening too often like the next james bond movie you know hopefully there's not going to be another traitor in mi6 that's you know working for the villain you know we can wait maybe two or three movies before that happens again so um as long as it's not a frequent thing like i said you can still surprise the audiences if it's written well all right yeah, no time to die is a, is, a, is a, for me it was uh, the you kind of knew when uh, with the opening gun barrel where there was no blood something was funny. Yeah, and then when they killed Felix Leiter, you thought, oh, well, what's going on here? And mm-hmm. then I think from that point you kind of figured, well, you know, and especially when they're driving in the pre-title sequence, we have all the time in the world. You're thinking, oh my God, what's mm-hmm. going on here? 
we know what happens at the end of Honor Mansion. So I think they tipped their their hat early in that yeah. film. And so that wasn't very well done, in my opinion. Um, so a lot of people weren't surprised. Well, let's be honest, I was shocked when they killed him. I think they would never do that, no matter what. Yeah. But if you watch the film again and you realize, okay, there's a there's a marker there. There's a, there's another thing there. There's another thing there. And oh, cool. of course, he has a die at the end now because, you know, he, he can't live a normal life. He's got a, uh, a Madeline and he's got a child and all that stuff. He has to die because he, he can't go on because it's the way they were. So, you know, it all depends on the writing, of course, right? But I think it, that's a prime example of a lot of, of um, moments where they've given away what's going to happen at the end. Okay. Well, do you think um, that Madeline was her first, the first child he sired? <laughs> with as many as he, yeah, women so, as he was with. Was, but in the context of the films, right? Yeah. Like you don't think yeah. like that, right? Yeah. Right, right, right. Bond is always the hero. He survives. We want it to be tough for him, but at the end of the day, he's going to survive. But there's no way yeah. that the way they were setting it up slowly that you yeah. knew something was up at the end and he was probably going to die. So, yeah. yeah. Even Ian Fleming, when he in one of his interviews, when they asked him, you know, would you ever kill off James Bond in one of your stories? And he said, oh, no, I could never afford that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. But these guys did. <laughs> That's the thing. Like, with no time to die. Yeah, I kind of suspected. About a year before the film, I just had a feeling that they might kill Bond off. I mean, I'm, it was nothing. And I remember when the film was released, uh, I read the, you know, I, I saw, and when people saw it in the premiere in London, and I'm reading the reviews and, and, and reading between the lines, I kind of figured that was going to happen. Okay. So I wasn't totally shocked that it occurred either. But taking all that aside, if you're watching the movie and you know what a Bond film is like, and then it's the moment they kill Felix, then yeah. you know, and I missed the the, the, the no blood in the gun barrel. I mean, my first time on, so then I realized that. So, but you, the moment they kill Felix, you you knew that this is all bets were off in, in terms of being you know being a film. But having said that, with respect again to Bond, people like predictability within within a Bond. There's a reason why a Bond film is what it is, and they expect certain things to happen within the context of the movie. Other spy films that aren't part of a franchise. Then it's 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 I guess you know depends on the, what film you're seeing I guess so yeah 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 but I think we like surprise don't we we don't want to be able to say okay this is what's going to happen like when you watch the Union you're thinking okay you know we've seen this before we've seen that before yeah it's time for a car chase <laughs> yeah time for a car chase Rule is not enough is a good example of uh, you know you're thinking Renard 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 mm-hmm. and turns out to be Electra right so that was a good that yeah 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 That's, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff is good. Mm -hmm. All right, so we think, okay, so predictable stuff we don't like. We like surprises, and uh, we've all articulated that. All right. I think there's a a, a view, like, there's only really seven plots. And then once you start doing your eighth story, because there is a degree of predictability, it's all a kind of a magic sleight of hand. So, for (laughs) example, girl meets boy could become girl meets girl. Uh, But it's the same story as Romeo and Juliet, but within a different context. You know, so it's all a sleight of hand. So it takes a couple of viewing, for example, to watch You Only Live Twice, The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker, and realise that it's essentially the same story. Mm -hmm. It isn't immediately obvious. Tomorrow never dies within it. It uh, But, you know, it's that slightness of hand. I didn't see the death of of M Judy Dench coming and mm-hmm. um, until until literally seconds before and I thought they're not really going to do this are they <laughs> um, and um, and they did um, and also I thought the same at the end of No Time to Die they're not going to kill James Bond are they they did that before in sixty seven with Casino Royale. <laughs> um, it, so it's not the first time he's died on the big screen. Um, if you remember the end of yep. the David Lynch film, yeah, um, only this yep. time was a bit less comedic and more dramatic. Um, so yeah, it depends on the predictability because there are things you kind of expect, but it's how do you do it, mm-hmm. like of handness, yeah. I like that concept of sleight of hand, yeah, that's good, yeah. Ledger domain, yeah, yeah, all right, cool. <laughs> I know this is one of Tom's pet peeves is <laughs> <laughs> unnecessary. I know right where you're going with this one. <laughs> unnecessary romantic subplots. 
Mm. Man, a lot of times we expect this now in spy movies. James Bond certainly conditioned us that, hey, there are going to be women involved. There are going to be relationships involved in, in all of this. Sometimes it becomes the event in the movie, and sometimes it just doesn't fit in. And sometimes they force it in there. Like when we we did the review of the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare and the Heroes of Telemark, they force fed us these relationships that weren't in, they were based on real stories, real history, but the relationship was not in the history, in the historical stuff. They forced it on us. So, hey, they expect a relationship here. So we're throwing that in there. What do you guys think of this romantic subplots in all these movies now? Yeah, if it's if it's part of the story, like we know Ian Fleming, all his Bond books that he wrote, there was always a woman involved. So you would expect there to be some sort of a romantic angle of, of some sort. The one time we didn't see it in a Bond movie was in Skyfall, well, also Quantum of Solace yeah. and, and Skyfall. Um, you know, yeah. there wasn't a romantic entanglement. I mean, you know, Skyfall there was, but the Bond girl didn't last very long. You know, she was killed off in the middle of the movie. Mm-hmm. And in Quantum of Solace, I mean, to me, it seemed more, it was okay. It seemed more realistic. It was based more on reality that Bond's not going to always mm-hmm. sleep with the main girl. Um, but as far as unnecessary romance, I know like back in the 60s and 70s, you know, when they made movies, they always had to throw a female character in there so that way they can draw in uh, a female audience uh, to watch the movie with their husbands and boyfriends. Yeah. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And so, like, my father, you know, he always says that uh, The Great Escape with Steve McQueen is one of his most favorite movies because there's no women in the movies in that movie. There's no, there's no women. There's no romance. Nothing. What a misogynist a story. <laughs> yeah. so he was, he was yeah, saying how much he good. loves that movie. But, yeah, if, it if, it's, if it's important to the story, that's fine. But if you're just throwing it in there just to say, oh, yeah, we need a female in there so we can draw the female audience. Like, there's a lot of female audiences who – don't care for that either that you also mm-hmm. feel like yeah what's the point of having it in there if it doesn't work um so you know it goes it all goes back to the clever writing and creating good characters mm-hmm. i suppose yeah but the, the, the thing about what you just said is you were talking about having females in there and i think it's really the romantic relationship part of it that i have the biggest problem with is like uh, you take something where it's you know having having females in there's fine right but when you sit there and say okay let's take something like operation mincemeat Mm-hmm. real story mm-hmm. they were nailing the story and then they threw this romance in there that wasn't real that right. didn't seem to add anything to the movie yet you had fe- you had female leads in that movie so you didn't you didn't need to tie it around to a romantic part of it uh-huh. and to me shacking up isn't the romantic part it's when there's you know all of a sudden hey i'm in love with her or whatever that's where i think a lot of these stories go off off the rails uh, okay yeah i agree with you there it's like like you said, Quantum of Solace, you had a Bond girl in there, but there was no romantic mm-hmm. liaison. I mean, she gave him, I guess he gave her a kiss before she left and that was it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he had his affair with uh, Strawberry Fields, mm-hmm. um, but it was more grounded in reality. Yeah. Even in the books, he doesn't always get the girl. I mean, Moonraker, he doesn't get the girl at the end of the Moonraker. So, uh, you know, that part's fine. In the Bond films, they want to, you know, they put the gadgets and they put the girls in it, right? Mm-hmm. It's Bond's means to an end. That's all it is. Yeah, um, there you go. Except for Honor Majesty's Secret Service, of course, mm-hmm. right? Where he falls in love and, and all that stuff. But, uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, that's what they want to put on the, on the screen, right? They got to have, you know, you got a handsome guy. You got explosive. Let's put a pretty girl in there. Let's, maybe they hook up, maybe they don't, right? But it's all visual stimuli, for the for the audience, right, and uh, and they've never really worked in the Bond films. It's a means to an end for for Bond to to finish his mission, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, and other spy movies as well, right. Sometimes it just doesn't work, but it's thrown in there because you've got to take care of the male audiences wanting to see a beautiful woman, right. Yeah. You're not going to see an ugly woman, mm-hmm. right. It's just it's just not going to wait. It's not going to happen, <laughs> and so uh, yeah, and so for Bond. You know, they're always going to cast a beautiful woman, um, but a serious relationship rarely happens in as yeah. far as Bond is concerned. 
Let's look at our uh, eighth bullet point here on pet peeves, the excessive use of CGI. Now, we're seeing it more and more now, of course, and it's becoming more refined CGI so that you're not it's not exactly like die another day stuff that was going on. It's become a little more refined and maybe more acceptable. But, boy, when we interviewed Rick English, he's a stunt performer. He was in the Kingsman series and all kinds of movies. And it's sometimes nice to see the stunts performed by real people because it makes it more realistic. It makes it more enjoyable, I think. But we're going to see more and more of the use of CGI. So what do we fans of spy movies think of CGI and how it should be used? And let, let's discount what you've already talked about, Pietro, and die another day. Right? <laughs> yes. we, yes. we know that stinks. Let's go on. <laughs> I guess my question is, is um, I, I haven't got any kids. I don't know if you guys have got kids, um, and nephews, nieces, whatever. But I guess my question is, looking at it at my age, I would kind of agree with you. But how would a 12-year-old um, look, look at the films today? So, for example, would a 12-year-old look at the CGI film, the superhero films of today with the same awe that I had with the Christopher Reeve 78 Superman mm. or not? So I don't know. Is this maybe more of an age issue? Type? Yeah. I mean, me personally, I would I would love to see more people doing stunts and everything. Um, it will um, it is better and it makes it more believable, more real. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Yeah, you have the danger and the cost of real people too with the stunts, right? right? So. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. It might be the age group. I mean, look at what's the most popular thing now is is all these superhero movies, right? That's mm -hmm. that's what they're going to see. And like uh, we were saying earlier, someone I think it was Bill said, "Hey, you got to attract younger audiences. If you're the James Bond and Mission Impossible people, and you want a franchise going, you have to draw new people into it, or you're going to wither up and die." So, I don't know. Everybody else, what do you think? CGI stuff. It all depends whether it's done well or not. <laughs> Die Another Day was awful. It was mm -hmm. bloody awful. It was no surfing down base. For, terrible. Casino Royale was done fantastic because they used CGI properly. They took they CGI'd out the wires. And mm -hmm. so it looked very real. Live and Let Die, there was no CGI. You had guys driving speedboats, doing all the stunts for real. That's what you want. You want to see the reality. So CGI, yeah. if it's done well, okay. But you, you know, it's it's technology, right? You, sometimes they, they make these decisions based on cost. It's easier to do CGI than it is to hire stuntmen mm -hmm. to do the work. And uh, you know, Bond early Bond films, they didn't have that technology. It was rear screen projection and all that stuff. But if you're going to use it, use it properly. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean. That's it, right? It's got to look good, bottom line. If it looks chintzy and cheap and corny, don't mm -hmm. use it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, if C and if CGI is used, is used properly, like I was thinking of, like the, the um, title, pre title signals to Moonraker, where you see everybody, and they did, they filmed it how many times they went up in the plane, they dropped with the parachutes constantly. But you can see the parachutes underneath the, the, the actors or the stuntmen. And CGI to, to take out the just, the, the parachute itself, I need, but still keep the stunt the way it is. That's a, I would think a proper use of CGI. Okay. But actually doing the stunts is a lot is a lot better than just creating on a computer because it's it's like a cartoon. Not that I guess animation, but not not in a live action. Yeah, and I do think people, I think audiences, young or old, they're pretty savvy about CGI. They know if something looks fake, doesn't look realistic, mm -hmm. and you know, like my son, my son's eighteen. I mean, he's he's seen action movies before you know the recent ones and what have you and he could tell if it doesn't look realistic or not or if they've gone overboard or it just looks plain silly as long as it's done correctly and and smartly and it it looks as realistic as possible it works but if it, if it looks cheap or if it, they go overboard then it's it's a waste of time i do like what they're doing with cgi with the facial replacement stuff so yeah. like when we were talking to Rick English, he was talking about when, and he was showing some, he gave us some pictures of from the Kingsman, how he has these dots on his face. So he does a stunt and then they put Colin's face on him. Oh, yeah. yeah and yeah. so it looked his like. His body. Yeah. And so it, I thought that was good. The other thing is if you're going to do a practical stunt, 
don't give it away. I mean, to me, mm. they killed Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning with all the hype over that damn motorcycle jump. And the <laughs> first time we should we should have seen that was in the theater. Right. And I think marketing blew it. Right. So they if you're gonna do this, time. yeah, if you're gonna do this fantastical practical work like that, please don't give it to me in the trailers. Yeah, they actually showed it in the theater when we went to see the movie. In you know how they give you all the stuff before they start the dang movie is twenty minutes. Well, we were there on they preview showed night. that stunt. <laughs> well, we were there on preview night, so that was that was a. I don't think they. Yeah, but they still, it's not, the they still shouldn't do that. That's yeah. like terrible. They should have showed that after the movie. Here's how yeah, we did that idea. cool thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. The flip side of the coin of CGI, of course, is realism in action scenes. And fans want to, I think fans want to suspend their disbelief and, and, and get into the movie and buy it and buy what they see on the, on the screen. So, but the, the suspension has to be easy to do. <laughs> if it's hard to do, it makes it tough on the fan to buy it. So action sequences, this is again, going to tie back into all the stuff we just talked about. And you look at Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, when Ethan is climbing the outside of the Burj Khalifa skyscraper in Dubai, everyone was thinking how ridiculous this thing is. This is a stunt I can't suspend my disbelief on. However, Mm -hmm. we've done the research on this. It was based on real technology, and there were companies actually developing adhesive gloves like this, so you could do things like that. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) it's always this, this combination of stuff that's going on where what you're seeing and what you believe, and then how you're going to react to that. So we like to look at gadgets in the spy movies, when the technology is believable, not believable, all that kind of stuff we talked about. So what happens here? The action scenes, we want them to be believable. So how do we make them more believable? How do we react to that as spy movie fans when we see these action sequences on the, on the screen? What do we want? For me, I think it's... It- you got to make it as realistic as possible. You know, sometimes as far as car chases, fight scenes, sometimes they go on longer than they should because maybe the producers think this is what the audience want. And maybe a lot of them do. The younger ones do. Uh, I was was thinking about the transporter, the first transporter movie with Jason Statham. Um, He had a fight scene to where he knocks over a, a drum of oil and he uh, takes off uh, bicycle pedals so he doesn't slip. And he, I think for like five minutes, he's slipping around, sliding around and fighting and knocking people out. And it got boring. It got tiresome. I know they were trying to show off his, you know, because, I mean, he does a lot of his own, most of his own stunts. So they were trying to showcase what he was able to do. Mm-hmm. But if if it goes on for too long, if the car chases are too long, if the fight scenes are too long, in my opinion, I think, I mean, at least for me, I get bored. It's like, okay. if you want a good car chase, if you want a good fight scene, make it really strong, make it explosive, but brief, and then just get on with the story. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, like, the world is not enough is a prime example, for me anyway. The boat chase, the pre sequence, way too long. <laughs> story. It's just, you know, okay. Yeah, he's got the Q-boat and all that stuff, but it just went on and on and on and on. You know, the stupid, you know, all through the canals or whatever, and the police trying to lock, put a lock on the car and getting soaked and all. It just went on and on and on. It just, it just got too much of a good thing. Just do, do a bit of it and uh, and let's move on. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, and, you know, realism again. The audience doesn't know is how realistic, like, you know, Die Another Day, for example, let's go going back to that movie where he's on the ice and he's ch- being chased by the Jaguar and all that. And then the Jaguar fires a missile and Bond, uh, no, Bond's upside down in the Aston Martin and he engages the ejector seat to flip him back. Well, right. realistically, he's going to blow a hole in the ice. It's not going to be that it's going to push him up, right? It, because it's the hood that's coming off. It's not a, you know, the hood's not going to have enough force to flip the car back upright, in my opinion. Anyway, I don't know. How, there how you go, see? <laughs> right, so, yeah. You movie producers, you got to listen to this stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> now, while, while I think there should be realism, definitely should be, but sometimes you guys suspend your disbelief, too. I mean, going back to an older Bond film, you remember twice, Little Nelly, that's a great, great sequence. 
but where did all the ammunition come from? Where was it stored in, in that little auto gyro? You know? yeah. it's, <laughs> There's a lot of that issue, uh, right. right? Even Thunderball, he's squirting all the water out of it at those guys, uh, right? Where's all that water kept in there? Holy God. Yeah, right. <laughs> but then you have an underwater breather that looks really realistic. That was just That's totally great. made up. Yeah. Uh, right. hold the <laughs> and the military wanted to buy it. <laughs> in real life. All right. That's cool. All right. So we came into this episode with a list of questions for you guys about pet peeves in spy movies. Are there anything that we that we failed to mention? Something that just gets at your craw about a spy movie trend that you see? Well, for me, and I've mentioned it earlier, it's this bringing it all back to the hero. I used to prefer the old days where the heroes came in, sorted the problem, and left. It's mm-hmm. this whole everything's got to go back. But um, you know, we mentioned that earlier. Really? Now, for the Bond films, for me, um, you know, the stories change. And all that. For me, it's the marketing of the Bond films, the artwork, the posters. It's just turned to crap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The forward blunt. <laughs> Since, uh, I guess, License to Kill, they just started to get away with these images and die another day with Halle Berry. And just put, like, it's just, they've lost their freaking imagination. The art is gone. Hire an artist to do something because this is all fantasy stuff, right? Get a nice sketch art. Get bring back a Robert McInnes, uh, McCarthy, and all these guys. Find the new versions of those guys and have them just redo the artwork. It's just and Die Another Day was just awful. Just pictures of them posing, right? Uh, We know what these actors look like. I don't want to see them in costume (laughs) or a real photograph on a poster. You're right. Those are the worst. It's just (laughs) terrible, right? So that's one of my pet peeves as far as Bond is concerned, is is the way they market the movie. I I think I think No Time to Die was the worst ones where where you had um, photos of Daniel Craig um, 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 in front of half of the seven of the 007 logo. And you think if I didn't know any who Daniel Craig was, you know, if it was an, um, an um, or any anything of the history or anything, would that actually entice me to go to a cinema or a movie theatre to watch this film? No. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I agree with you guys hundred percent. I mean, and the thing is, in terms of marketing, though, I think things are designed now to like fit on a cell phone. If you look mm. at the phone, you, that that's the image, and the, and the, these beautiful paintings that they did back in the old olden days wouldn't the image would be too big to fit in that sm- sm- smaller frame. Ah, uh, okay. That's just the idea behind it. By certainly this does all posters, absolutely. Yeah, yeah right. but they had a they had a competition for artwork for No Time to Die before it was released, and there was a lot of great things that were, was out there, and they just went with that boring garbage that, that they used. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. And all again right. on the marketing, don't give it all away. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, Mission Impossible. Kingsman, Harry comes back in Kingsman 2, right? In the Golden Circle. It was in the marketing materials. It was supposed to be a surprise. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. These pet peeves that we've been talking about here for the last hour highlight the balance that spy movies need to strike between innovation and tradition, realism and fantasy to keep fans engaged and satisfied. So thanks to our special guests from our Facebook group, Bill Canis, Morgan Lisney, Eric Seabury, and Pietro Rossi, who have helped frame these issues from a fan's perspective. Thanks, you guys. Thank you you very much, guys. Thank Thank you you both. Appreciate it. Happy James Bond Day. Yep. Yeah, yes. Happy That's James Bond morning. Day to everybody. Now you know what day we're recording this at. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. This has been Dan. And Tom. Of SpyMovieNavigator.com and our podcast show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Subscribe to our show and our YouTube channel as well. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it. Thanks.